Hey, what's up you amazing hackers? I hope you're all doing well today. I have this amazing guest with me. My guest today is the creator of Rust Scan. He's an employee of Triacme, but he's done so much more. I'm not going to introduce him for you. I'm going to let him introduce himself. How are you doing, Mr. b -san? Uh Hello, uh, my name is B, or Brandon. I work for Trihackme. I invented Rust Scan and Sophie. I do a lot of uh, open source work, Discord work, uh, subreddit and stuff like that. You've probably seen me around if you hang around, try hack me a lot, so that's me. That's a really impressive track record. Um, can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about what got you inspired about helping people so much? Oh, so I was in university once and my teacher was so boring it was just the worst lectures I'd been to in my life. And eventually I thought to myself, I could teach my I could teach everyone in this class better than the teacher can. So then I went home and I wrote a bunch of blog posts. And then people stopped going to lectures and they just went to like my library study sessions with me. So then I eventually started teaching like cybersecurity too. So that's how I got into teaching people. I got into Try Hack Me from, I saw it in some cybersecurity form two years ago, three years ago. And then I joined the Discord last year and I've just been active ever since. That's really awesome, especially <laughs> that you started teaching others that you're at such an early age already. Um, <laughs> like, can you tell me a little bit about what it's like to work for Try Hack Me? Um, sure, it's quite fun. I get a free subscription. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's all remote work. I personally don't have any hours, so I can just work whenever I want. So long as so my main role is support staff, where I just answer emails all day, well not all day, only a couple hours a day. But I also do uh, subreddit stuff, Discord, uh, creating content, and stuff like that. And I just do it whenever I feel like it. Uh, I get paid for it. That's and then. Really cool. Yeah, it's a very relaxed environment. That's really awesome, especially like the fact that you can pick your own hours and that you can work. As, of course, you have to get your work done. I think that's something that <laughs> I think that yeah, most, uh, I, I think uh, some of the other Trihackney employees have actual hours, but I, I don't. I just get told like uh, what twenty hours a week. I can do it whenever I want. I could do it all on Monday if I wanted and just go on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> It's really cool that you get that much privilege, uh, but I'm sure like um, working for TriHackMe must have some like um, it must have um, some responsibilities for you as well that you that you have yeah. to oblige by, and and of course you have to fulfill those, and and it it sounds really cool, but of course I think you have a lot of free time because of that as well, um, like. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about what drove you to write things like Rust Scan? Um... Oh, so Rust Scan in particular, it was a funny story actually. I was a, uh, it's written in the language called Rust and I wanted to learn Rust in the summer because it's a uh, up and coming language. Lots of people want to learn it. And I remember I was walking through a field in the summer. I was quite drunk <laughs> and I was thinking like, what, what could I make with Rust? it would be cool. And the two big features of Rust on the website were networking and it's very fast. So then I was trying to think of what common networking issues do people have that I can solve? So then I originally thought like, ah, oh, MAP's really slow. You know, there's new people out there that don't know how to make MAP fast. They may as well just write this really small tool. It was about 50 lines of code, took me like six hours. <laughs> then I posted it on Reddit and it got 2,000 GitHub stars on that same day. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, and then it, it was kind of insane. It only took me like six hours to make. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really cool. And so yeah. many people use it now. By the way, for you yeah. guys who don't know, who haven't checked it out, uh, try Hack Me from, uh, I mean, the subreddit for try Hack Me is really, really cool. There's going to be a link in the description as well. I forgot to tell that um, in the previous section. <laughs> 
And did you like Rust? That sounds like complicated language. Did it take you? Was it complicated to pick up or? Yeah, it's a it's a very complicated language because it's it's a low level like C plus plus, but it's got a called a borrow checker, which means it uh, it really forces you to write stuff differently than how you'd expect it to. In the end, your code looks really nice and it works quite well, but writing it is quite hard. Rough scan today is still only like what 400, 500 lines of code. Wow! So. That's insane. And that's because, yeah, it's because Rust is a, such a clean language. Yeah, that's that's insane. And is it like, I, I imagine Rust scan is mostly like like linear algorithms. Is there any AI involved in Rust scan as well? Or is it pure? Oh, there is a, there's some AI. So the definition of AI that I use is from Russell and Norvig's Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, which is any new technology counts as artificial intelligence, <laughs> which is a very broad, but it's true in a way. Rust scan uh, scans your operating system to make it make itself faster. It knows how much knows about your hardware as well, and we're working on a feature where it scans the uh, the network link between you and your target to make itself faster. Um, it's really easy to make a slow scanner that's undetectable. You just scan like one one port a day. It's really hard to make a really fast one. It's always fast. Yeah, that's true. That's some really deep stuff there. Um, <laughs> the AI, I, I think you kind of answered my next question a little bit already, but do you <laughs> think it has some future in cybersecurity? Oh, yeah, for sure. It definitely does. There's a, lots of companies already taken AI. It's... I believe eventually one day a lot of penetration testing will be replaced with AI. I think particularly bug bounties would be very helpful for AI. It'll be, yeah, AI is a, it's a tool that helps do things. So uh, kind of the really boring stuff that you may not want to do, like if you have a, a bunch of targets and you want to repeat, repeatedly check if they're their web servers have changed for exploits. AI would be really good there. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's lots of companies that use it, like a, a company called Dark Trace. I don't know what they do, but they. Yeah, I heard about them as well. And like you say, I think there are some caveats to it, but a lot of people think AI is this ever mighty being that's going to take over our jobs as bug bounty hunters completely. I think it does have its place, but seeing as there are so many disadvantages of it still, like test data bias, um, I think we still have quite a long way to go. I don't know if you agree on that. Yeah, we have, a, I'd say we have about 30 years to it could pose a threat. A lot of people think, uh, if you look back at 20 years, a lot of people think that AI wasn't going to go anywhere. And then 16 years later, we have AI that can beat like the best players in the world at League of Legends, which is a video game, but it's, it's a hard video game. So in another 16 years, if it can already like beat players at League of Legends, I assume it'd be a lot better at like uh, penetration testing. But then also humans get better as we go on. So True. it depends. Yeah, that's true as well. Um, I always like to call it augmented intelligence instead of artificial intelligence, because I think we as humans still has, have our own swing to give to it. It's not like we can create intelligence out of nothing. It's still bound by rules. And that's what some people seem to forget about it. Um, yes. Uh, if you look at AlphaGo, which won the Go Championships, they had to hire a European Go champion to consult and help AlphaGo grow as a program. So in the future, if AI did take over penetration testing, companies would still hire penetration testers to look over the AI and make sure it's okay. Like they did with AlphaGo or with uh, DeepMind and all the other AIs. Yeah, true, true. I think humans will always be needed to check to work at least. I 
I mean, at some point, AI might be able to check itself, and that's when things become really scary. But until then, we still don't have that much to fear, I think. Um, we also have a lot of a bias in AI that would cause issues. Only humans can really see bias. That's true. Um, I heard the story once about an AI that was taught to recognize wolves from dogs. And it saw a picture of a dog in the snow and it recognized it as a wolf because all of the wolf pictures were taken in the snow. <laughs> so, yeah, and there's, there's a, sorry, there's a, uh, a networking app for women only. It uses AI to recognize if you're a woman, but if you're transgender, you can't get on the app because it's, it's biased against transgender people. Oh, that's terrible. So that's a, yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a very bad company. I don't think they're going to, be around for much longer. <laughs> yeah, it has some very <laughs> dark sides as well. Um, maybe a totally unrelated question. Can you tell us a little bit about Syfy? Oh, sure. Syfy is a, a CyberChef magic, if anyone's used it. You input text, CyberChef magic will break it, tell you what the decrypted text is. Syfy does that, but on, a, on like steroids, it's really hardcore. Uh, Cyberchef Magic only does encodings, Syfy does encryptions and hashes as well. It uses uh, artificial intelligence, specifically search algorithms, which tells it... Uh, so you have text, and if you decrypt it with Caesar cipher, it could be encrypted with base64 or encoded with it. And the artificial intelligence tells you uh, which route is most likely to succeed in the plain text which is a really clever use of it. A lot of people think it's, uh, they see it and they're like, oh, artificial intelligence is so bloated, it doesn't need that. But it's not like a neural network, it's a search algorithm, it's coded all in Python, there's no libraries for it. That's a, a lot of people see artificial intelligence and always assume it. But sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just as simple as a little, little bit of maths. All it is is probability. Yeah. uses natural language processing to determine when it sees a plain text. It's actually more popular than Rustscan. It's got 40,000 more downloads and 3,000 more GitHub stars. Wow. It's, it's very good, yeah. So let that be a lesson for everybody who thinks they don't need maths or programming. You really, really do. <laughs> Especially if you want yeah. to get in that kind of stuff. Well, well Syfy took me a... I started programming it when I was 12. And then oh. I kept on rebuilding it every year. I only released it in 2019, but then it only got popular in 2020 summer. So it took me like, what, 10 years for it to succeed? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's the longest, that's gotta be the contender for the longest running project ever. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's literally older than, than a GCHQ CyberChef oh, wow. program by like seven years. <laughs> that's really cool. Now, the fact that you're able to do all this stuff, like, um, it's, it's inspiring, especially considering your background story. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Uh, I grew up in the care system, but I was never adopted. So uh, I don't know what they're called in other countries. Here it's called care leavers, because you just leave the care of the local council. You don't get a family. On your 18th birthday, they say goodbye now. Oh, wow. <laughs> You'll never get a family. Yeah, <laughs> it's really hardcore in the UK. They they don't like care leavers at home. I also have autism, which was uh, a struggle in school, especially because I found a lot of schoolwork very boring. And I remember I was in the uh, the bottom set for my computing class at school because I just refused to do the coursework because it was like Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. Like, I, I don't need to learn this. I, I can do stuff in my free time instead. So, it uh, hasn't really affected the coding. More so just that my government doesn't really like me as a person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's terrible, man. Like, the this. The, the autism part, I can fully recognize that. I was, I failed all of my classes that I didn't have any interest for, like like French, maths, uh, all of those Dutch, like like even basic Dutch, I failed Dutch while I, I was perfectly human <laughs> in it. It's my mother language. Yeah. 
And it's but really cool and inspirational that you've been able to climb up this far, man. So thank you very much. For yeah, schools, schools are definitely for like, uh, they just want everyone to be the same. They don't want any unique. You're a, you're a bug bounty professional and you teach people. You would never learn that in school ever. Exactly. You, you can't find your passion in school, really. You have to find it doing hobbies. Yeah, it's like I've never met a school that says we have a hacker training here. And if it does, it's <laughs> like, OK, you can maybe learn the basics of hacking, but there are so many aspects. It's, it's impossible. My uh, my university, the cybersecurity class, I remember they told me that SHA-1 was a, a secure hashing algorithm. And we should use SHA-1 in password databases. This was a T20, <laughs> like Sha-1 in 2020, come on, <laughs> maybe in the 80s. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> so uh, Extremely outdated. Yeah, like some people even recognize that, even say that some of the more recent Sha hashing algorithms shouldn't be used anymore, and I, I tend to agree with them on that, you know. Like the, the the most recent ones, they are secure for now. But even until like like until quantum computers come out, because even after then, it's uncertain what will happen for me. I mean, we we have quantum hashing algorithms, so it should be okay. Okay, they already developed those. Then it's good. Yeah, we have a we have a, so there's an algorithm called Shaw's algorithm, mm -hmm. which is fast prime factorization. It's used for breaking. Uh, Diffie Hellman RSA kind of stuff. But we have another algorithm, which is that the encryption version in quantum computing, which is more secure than RSA. So the second we get quantum computers, we already have the algorithms that can't be solved by them. Oh, that's but if it's like, if like Russia gets a quantum computer first, they can break all of our encryption and we would never know. <laughs> and we can never break theirs because we don't have a quantum computer. So it's like a race for quantum computers right now. Quantum supremacy, they call it. That's really cool. And it sounds like it has some really interesting challenges as well, especially if you want to integrate it with existing systems. Like you want to integrate quantum uh, quantum hashing with normal decryption, maybe. I don't know. It seems like it has some interesting challenges ahead of it. Yeah, you would also have to... Because uh, quantum computers in the immediate future are very specific servers in like data centers. So you can never do, you can never hash client side. You'd have to go to the server to be hashed, which is a bad idea for many reasons, <laughs> as you probably know, as a bug bounty expert. <laughs> I don't so, know, as a bug bounty hunter, I would uh, encourage that behavior yeah. because I like money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, just kidding. Um, I would totally dis discourage that, of course. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your books? Because you've written quite a few of them. Oh, yeah. I just uh, I just write a bunch of blog posts. And then when I've written enough, I think, oh, this would be really nice as a book. So then I rewrite them into a book. <laughs> I don't really think about it much. It's like uh, if you're a YouTuber and you make videos and a bunch of things, you know, like, this would be really nice as a video course. And you just remake them and sell it. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's like sometimes it starts out like that. Sometimes it starts out more like uh, the other way around. Like, oh, it, that would be an interesting course. Maybe I can release the videos on YouTube. <laughs> so maybe yeah, that would yeah. be a way for you to maybe switch it up a little bit. Write a book first, and then write a bit of blog posts about it. <laughs> it's uh, it's marketing too. Because uh, do you know the book The Martian by Andy Weir? Weir? Yeah. He wrote The Martian as blog posts on a WordPress site. Every chapter, it was a new blog post. And then in the comments, people would be like, no, you idiot, this is what would really happen in space. <laughs> and he'd rewrite it. And then by the end, he'd have like a book that was really good. Because other people in the comments like rewrote his stuff for him. That's really cool. <laughs> That's some cool crowdsourcing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's That's hilarious. Really awesome. So... I would like to thank you very, very much for today, for your time. Uh, one last question. Do you have any more tips for our viewers? Tips for, uh, use TryHackMe, subscribe for it. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope I get a promotion now. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just uh, do they try harder, pay attention more, uh, learn things you wouldn't normally learn. Like uh, a, a good example is sorting algorithms in computer science. You could exploit a sorting algorithm that causes a denial of service attack, but you wouldn't know that unless you studied that. So it's, it's really important to study as much as you can about as many different topics as you can, because you'd learn things you'd never really know otherwise. Love that tip. That's a really good one. Thank you very much. And no joke, try hack me is really, really good. You guys should really go try that out. If you guys want more information, you guys can find it in the description below. Um, all follow me on Twitter. All of the links will be in there. Exactly. Follow this guy on Twitter. He's amazing. Go check out his books as well, because they may have been based on blog posts, but they are much more than that, guys. <laughs> Thank you. You can you can read the books actually, but it's going to take a while to load in your web browser. <laughs> yeah. You're better off downloading them, buying them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, as well. Maybe somebody can write a script to combine all of your blog posts into your book again. <laughs> oh, I, I did that. It's on my blog, but your, your browser will crash. It's too long. It really is. <laughs> it, it's like a 400 megabyte blog first your your browser would not like that <laughs> yeah i think it would protest then <laughs> yeah thank you very very much for your time sir thank you everybody for watching if you want again you can find brandon on twitter thank you so much for being here and everybody i hope i'll see you on the next one bye you amazing hackers bye